Hello everyone, welcome to our monthly InfoSec seminar. Today we are happy to have Rasha Nasra to give us an interesting talk about ransomware evolution and future trends. Rasha Nasra leads the Canadian Center for Cyber Securities, Cyber Engagements and Partnerships for the Academic Lead, for the Academic Sector. Russia previously held different roles at the Cyber Center, including lead for one of the center's strategic cyber threat assessments team. Russia holds a doctoral degree in educational leadership from Western University and a master's degree in educational technology from Concordia University. Thanks, Russia, for accepting our invitation and being with us today. And thanks for sharing your experience with our audience. So please go ahead. Well, thank you very much for for having me. And uh, yeah, I'm sorry it's uh, it's not Concordia University at Edmonton. It's it's Montreal that I went to, uh, but I'm really thrilled to be here. I'm just gonna be uh, presenting my putting up my slides. One second. Okay, infosec seminar. All right, so do let me know if, uh, if you can see my screen in a second. Um, no, not yet. Yes. All right, is it full screen? Am I good? Yes. Perfect. Yes. Thank you very much. So okay. thanks again for, for your introduction, uh, Dr. Abdesalam. Really appreciate it. And thank you for the for the uh, invitation. Uh, uh, you know, it's it's a pleasure for the Cyber Center to be a part of your InfoSec seminars. Um, it's always a pleasure to get the opportunity not just to represent the Center for Cybersecurity, but to also engage with direct, uh, directly with you. Um, as you'd mentioned, I am the academic sector lead in terms of uh, partnerships for the, for the Cyber Center, and I've been working there for about five and a half years. And prior to that, I was a member of of your sector, the academic sector, as a faculty member and a researcher. So, uh, you know, this, this position that I'm in, uh, well, and prior to that, I was a student for, for many, 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 many years, uh, to the chagrin and uh, the sadness of my parents, of course, but that's something that's uh, uh, that any academic can relate to and uh, that they can appreciate. So being able to, to be in this position to engage with you uh, from a technical cybersecurity perspective is a role that I relish and one that I actually take very seriously because of the unique challenges that I know that the sector faces, especially in terms of the scope of the activities that rely on IT, um, especially given these days. So I'm going to start off uh, by giving yes. off... A Russia, bit. please, uh, we cannot see the slides. It's, I am sharing Firefox. Yes, we can see the screen, but... Is it? Um, stop sharing and then share again. Oh, sorry about that. No, All okay. I did was, yeah, technical difficulties. All right, window. Uh, if you don't mind, you can send me the slides and I can share it from my uh, from my computer. Can you see it now? Yes, yes. All right, okay. Thank uh, you. All right, let me know if it's moving ahead. Is this uh, did it advance without any issues? I should, have, I should have emailed you a copy. Do you see, is it still working? Yes, it's perfect. Okay, perfect. So I'm going to start off with a very short history of uh, what is the Cyber Center. I'm pretty sure most of you know this, but uh, uh, the Canadian Center for Cybersecurity, or what we usually refer to as the Cyber Center or Triple CS, is a business line of the Communications Security Establishment, CSE, uh, which is a federal organization that many, not many people have uh, have heard about, but uh, we're actually celebrating our 75th anniversary this year. And I'm going to share with you a very brief snapshot of our history and how uh, CSE came to be and how the Cyber Center came to be. Um, CSE was born of uh, World War II code breaking efforts by the communications branch of the NRC at the time. Uh, you may know of the British efforts to do this. Maybe you're a history buff or maybe you just saw the movie, The Imitation Game. Uh, but either way, it's a little known fact, uh, but uh, similar effect, uh, similar efforts to, to code break were going on in Canada here as, at the same time. And after the war into the Cold War, those efforts uh, continued. And in 75, CSE was formed operating under the National Defense Act to collect foreign signals intelligence, or what we refer to as SIGINT. 
um, as most of you know. Um, as the world became a more and more digital place, uh, you know, CSE's work began to focus more and more, of course, on the internet uh, and on digital communications. And while most of the organization still focuses on top secret work uh, in terms of gathering SIGINT, uh, the government was recognizing that there was a lot of work to do to defend not only the government of network, uh, government of Canada networks, but more importantly, Canadian digital infrastructure in general. And it was apparently, uh, you know, increasingly apparent that we couldn't do this from behind closed doors. So slowly the organization had to step out into the light um, um, as to speak. And in October 2018, the Canadian Centre for Cybersecurity was created. Um, it wasn't uh, an entirely new uh, line of business, but it actually was a new brand from an old business line of IT security. Uh, and its uh, intention is we basically provide cybersecurity advice and guidance and services. Uh, the Cyber Centre is Canada's authority on cybersecurity um, and the Government of Canada's uh, single source for, for expert advice, guidance services and support uh, in terms of cybersecurity. So if uh, any other organization just says Canadian anything, uh, that they're not the they're not the source. We are the only federal source for for cybersecurity when it comes to, to Canada. So in the same sense that you'd consult Environment Canada for weather reports, you'd consult the Cyber Centre in connection with any operational questions that you may have about um, cybersecurity. And uh, 2019 uh, was an important year for us because the CSE Act came into effect. And uh, the CSE Act, uh, as you see on the slide, essentially uh, sets out four aspects of our mandate, uh, three of which didn't really change. The foreign signals, intelligence, uh, gathering the SIGINT side of things did not change. Uh, we did that before. It did expand their changes in terms of the nuances and, and the details of what it uh, what we do. Um, the assistance to federal security and intelligence partners also continued with, with of course, improvements and changes. And there, were, there was the inclusion of foreign cyber operations for defensive um, purposes. Uh, what is really key here is the cybersecurity information an assurance uh, mandate that kicked in, uh, where which allowed us to engage with partners like yourselves, uh, and uh, the, the Canadian Centre for Cybersecurity uh, could then uh, you know become responsible for engaging with and and supporting uh, members of different different sectors uh, in terms of critical infrastructure. So. Um, I was going to remove the slide, but a nice picture is never heard, and and you, I don't, I don't know how many of you have been to Ottawa have seen us, but if you do happen to pass by Ottawa, feel free to drive by and, and wave to the cameras. But these are the buildings for the Cyber Center. Um, on the left hand side is the actual um, CSC campus, and on the right hand side you've got the uh, new uh, CS Cyber Center Vanier building, uh, that is just uh, they're, they're both headquartered in in Ottawa. Um, so what is, what is it that we do? In a nutshell, we do a lot of things. And we're also a new organization in the sense of our mandate uh, in terms of engaging with critical infrastructure partners. Uh, so uh, we continue to expand and broaden in many ways, uh, and we serve Canadians at all levels. Uh, the Cyber Centre offers many services and products that are listed here, and this is a very, very brief overview of um, our overall mandate and our history. Uh, but what I'd like to move to next is our is our actual topic, which is ransomware, um, specifically in education, just because um, it's uh, it's a bit of a longish topic, and I'd like to to get into it and delve into it. Um, I'm going to provide you with some background information that'll let you know why the threat is as menacing as it is. I'm pretty sure uh, you have. There hasn't been a, probably a cybersecurity uh, call that you haven't been on where ransomware was not mentioned in the last few years. So many people might be fed up of it, and might many people might think, "What is going on? Why why can't we seem to be able to get rid of this uh, this menace?" Um, that the past few years has certainly seen an exponential growth in a number of ransomware attacks, as well as multiple high-profile incidents, some of which I may refer to later on, uh, with record-breaking ransom demands. Uh, so in this seminar, I'm going to try to examine the evolution of ransomware and some of the technical enablers uh, that have, uh, you know, uh, contributed to the frequency and number of ransomware attacks that we've seen, as well as some future trends that we expect to see in this space. Uh, but before I get started to talk about ransomware, I want to go briefly over some changes that you all know, uh, but that need to be sort of stated uh, to, to sort of, again, highlight why this is such a big deal and why this is such a big issue. Um, 
nobody is uh, here shocked that you know we are becoming an increasingly more digital society. Uh, the next three slides that I'm going to show just some interesting statistics, even though they're from 2020. Uh, this bar graph simply shows that the most used devices to access the internet over the past three years, while 2020 is, a, is the red one, uh, still are computers. Uh, I did not I did not know that to be to be honest. I thought it was uh, going to be your phone, but apparently that's a close second. Smartphones and mobiles are coming in at 34 percent, and tablets. Uh, come in at much lower than that, and someone I think should uh, should tell Apple and and Samsung maybe they can reduce the prices of their tablets so that that, that can improve their numbers. But uh, computers still remain, uh, you know, they're the highest uh, uh, in terms of. Uh, uh, devices that are accessing the internet at any given time. Uh, smart homes, so this is uh, just the uh, the growth of uh, internet of things. Uh, we we know, uh, we noticed that, uh, you know, of course, everybody's uh, got a Bluetooth speaker and they tend to make up 41% uh, of smart home devices. And we see a lot of the Google voice assistants, the Alexas, and, and those are also continuing to increase um, in numbers as well. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, apparently a third of, uh, of Canadians have sworn at their voice activated assistants, which is, uh, not very Canadian like, uh, but seven and ten do say please and thank you to their voice activated assistants, which is a very extremely Canadian thing to do. Uh, and finally, just it's just an, a final image to just illustrate the percentage of Canadians that communicate with organizations and businesses online. Um, this is this as as you can imagine has only increased uh, in the time of the pandemic. Uh, we used to go to a store, we used to pick up a phone and call, but we've shifted to using technology, especially during pandemic times. So between uh, you know using the internet for our online banking, for working from home, attending online classes, Canadians are accessing the internet a lot. Um, and how many of you order food uh, via online delivery services? Uh, my visa seems to tell me that I exceed my allotted uh, uh, you know requirements for that every day. Uh, there's another example of how we're connecting uh, to the internet for everyday services, and soon that that connection is going to become less and less apparent to us as it just becomes, you know, an, a, such a such a you know ubiquitous uh, presence in our lives. So we all need to improve our cybersecurity and become more resilient to cyber attacks and become aware of what happens when we do expose ourselves that way. We live online, and that's wonderful, but it also opens us up to a big world of risks and potential dangers. Uh, before we lived online, we knew how to protect ourselves our workplaces, our identities. We knew that to talk to strangers or share personal information with them. Nobody who knocked on your door and told you, give me your wallet, uh, would get your wallet. But, uh, you know, we knew unless you lost your wallet, your personal information was relatively well protected and wasn't going to, uh, you know, be used halfway across the world. In fact, I think uh, people used to drop uh, lost wallets that they found in mailboxes. I'm not sure anybody does that uh, these days anymore. But the whole point is, everybody, you know, with everyone being a part of the digital world in one way or another, we share pretty much everything online. And it's becoming less and less uh, optional these days, as you may know, uh, especially when it comes to uh, sharing, traveling, or, or, you know, when we talk about COVID vaccines and, and the like, this is becoming, um, you know, a subject that simply cannot be avoided. Um, so a little over a year ago, August 2020 to be precise, uh, the Cyber Center, in fact, my previous team, uh, published the National Cyber Threat Assessment, it's called the NCTA, uh, in 2020. So this uh, it was exactly on, on uh, 13th of August. And this is what it said about ransomware. At the time, um, it said, we judge that almost certainly ransomware uh, directed against Canada in the next 12 months, so this is already passed, it's come to pass, will continue to target large enterprises and critical infrastructure providers, as well as organizations of all different sizes. Uh, many Canadian victims will continue to acquiesce to ransom demands due to the severe economic and potentially destructive consequences of refusing payment. And we assess that it's almost certain that cyber criminals will continue to scale up their ransomware operations and attempt to coerce larger payments from victims by threatening to leak or sell their data data online. Uh, less than a year later, um, there was an updated uh, bulletin, um, which, which should tell you something that we had to actually issue an update uh, about ransomware uh, that, the, that the Cyber Center published. And this was also from my previous team. This was January, and in it we stated that successful targeted ransomware campaigns, and by targeted we simply means, uh, you know, not the spray and pray type, not hitting everybody, will typically involve organized cyber criminal groups with very specialized roles and significant resources, and that targeted ransomware campaigns are adopting the TTPs of advanced persistent threats. Uh, we're seeing an entry, persistence, exfiltration of data, network recon, privilege escalation, so on and so forth. 
I also said that targeting is broad. Uh, using phishing campaigns, botnet services, RDP scanning, uh, what have you. But the target selection at the time is focused, meaning that we're that you know we're going to see less of this uh, you know going after entire uh, tranches of the sector, but going after specific targets. Um, now there is an update that is forthcoming, uh, not an assessment. And while I have not seen it and I cannot not quote it directly, I do know one thing. I wish that after several years of, of trying to address this issue, not just in Canada but globally. Um, I wish I could say that the, the, the update uh, is going to say that things have gotten better. Uh, unfortunately, I can't. In fact, I'm fairly certain that things are going to be getting exceedingly worse before they get better, uh, which is why talks such as this one and the roles that you guys play is so critical. Uh, ransomware is not just a cybersecurity threat. It's not just a personal threat. It's, it's a national security threat. Um, and when we talk about uh, ransomware and education, there is uh, several months ago, uh, uh, there's a uh, a nice uh, study that was done by Sophos that I'd like to reference. They did a survey and they released a white paper on the state of ransomware and education in 2021 that I'd like to refer to. And it also did not paint a pretty picture. Uh, it says the education sector has been a, an attractive target for adversaries for many, many reasons that you can relate to, of course. Uh, budgets for both IT and cybersecurity are often very tight and often compete. Uh, stretched IT teams battling to secure outdated infrastructure with limited tools and resources. Uh, risky online student behavior, such as downloading pirated software or what have you, also increases exposure to attack. And the pandemic has only exacerbated the challenge. Uh, many educational establishments, uh, yours of course included, switched uh, with very short notice to virtual remote learning environments, which left IT teams very little time to plan security strategy or invest in new IT infrastructure. And, and this rapid switch also limited opportunities for cybersecurity training for teachers, students. And now uh, an already overloaded staff is trying to shift back to uh, a hybrid system, perhaps uh, in anticipation while well, some classes have resumed uh, in person but uh, some have remained hybrid. So now you're supporting you're supporting two, two learning modalities. Uh, so there's there's a, a lot of stress in trying to maintain the agility that is that you've learned from the pandemic. Uh, Sophos commissioned the survey. Uh, it's about 5,400 IT decision makers globally and across a wide range of sectors. So it was interesting to see where the academic sector fell uh, within other organizations uh, and other sectors of different sizes. Um, and they were mostly mid-size or mid-size organizations. So we, we need to take these with a bit of uh, keeping that in mind though. Uh, though. Of those about 500 respondents were from academia and the survey was conducted uh, between January and February of this year. And the key findings were as follows. 44% um, of organizations were hit by ransomware in the last year and 58% of those that were hit had their data encrypted. 35% of those whose data was encrypted paid the ransom to get their data back. But of those who actually paid, they only got 68% of their data back. So almost a third was inaccessible. Only 11% of those that paid got all of their data back and 32% got half and less. So paying does not necessarily, uh, or certainly does not guarantee that you're gonna get your data not much uh, less, uh, you know, have it in a form that's, uh, that's usable for you. The ransom that was paid was in the academic sector and education is less than the global average. It was about 170,000 uh, and uh, globally, and it was about 112,000 for education, but still that's not a small sum. And this has to do with org size because uh, the, the survey went for organizations that had between 105,000 employees, and this is global as well. Um, other numbers, of course, and lists list higher uh, ransom demands. Total cost of uh, recovering between downtime, lost hours in terms of uh, cost of devices. Uh, so, you know, ransom payments, lost opportunities was the highest in academia amongst all the sectors that were surveyed and averaged on, uh, it was on average 2.73 million US dollars, which was around 48% above the global average across all sectors. Um, IT teams within academia were among the most heavily impacted by the pandemic was 74%. Uh, stating that they experienced an increase in cyber uh, security and cybersecurity uh, workload, second only to central government. And with that, of course, slowed response time to incidents as a result of this increased uh, workload. So 65% uh, responded that they experienced that, which was the highest of all the surveyed uh, sectors. Interestingly, almost two thirds 
um, of those who were surveyed expected to be hit by ransomware in the future, while conversely, about 39% didn't anticipate to be um, hit next year. And it's, what's interesting is that among those educational establishments that were not hit by ransomware, but that expected to, uh, the most common reason, 46% uh, uh, that they stated was that ransomware attacks are just so increasingly hard to stop due to their sophistication, which is which is true. And while this is a high number, the fact that organizations are alert to ransomware becoming even more advanced is a good thing. But there's uh, there kicks in uh, you know the the uh, helplessness of a situation, which is not always the case. Uh, in addition, 42% said that ransomware was simply way too prevalent for them not to get hit. It's so common, like I said, I, I don't think I've attended a call in the last several years where ransomware has not been mentioned. 26% um, of respondents see users, uh, you know, uh, compromising security as a major factor, which is great to see because it's not always blaming the user, uh, which, is, which is really important uh, for us. The most um, common factor uh, as I said, uh, you know, uh, the, for for uh, when we when we talk about uh, 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 you know the education uh, the education sector specifically when it comes to to, to the services that you provide um, has to do with you know the, the fact that a lot of it is invisible. So I thought it was really interesting that there was such a significant number, uh, like thirty nine percent didn't really anticipate to be hit at all, and the most common factor behind this. False confidence is uh, that they believe that they had uh, trained IT staff who were able to stop the attack, 60%. Uh, followed by the use of anti-ransomware technology. Um, in addition, 34 said they don't expect to be hit by ransomware because they work with a specialist cybersecurity company that runs a SOC. Sure, advanced automated technologies are essential um, for, for us to be able to uh, protect ourselves, but um, it's not all good news. 60% of education respondents that didn't expect to be hit are putting their faith as, are putting their faith in approaches that don't offer any protection from, from ransomware. 37 Seven percent said cybersecurity insurance against ransomware was gonna was gonna protect them. Sure, it can help cover the cost of uh, recovering or dealing with the attack, but it doesn't stop the attack itself. Uh, Thirty-six percent uh, cited air gap backups. Wonderful backups are valuable tools for restoring data post attack, but doesn't stop you from getting hit. And these are IT professionals that were being surveyed. 15% uh, simply said they're not a target of ransomware, and sadly that's not true. There is uh, no single organization that is safe. Um, this is just an interesting slide that I found in terms of targeted subsectors within academia, and you can see that uh, lucky you, you fall within the largest uh, section with primary and secondary schools following. Online education here uh, occupies a smaller number, but I believe this is simply just because it's online um, only institutions as opposed to uh, universities and colleges that offer uh, uh, dual, uh, dual format uh, or dual type of classes. Uh, so within, uh, while, while the sector that we typically talk about a lot during the pandemic is of course the healthcare sector because we have seen of course attacks against hospitals, the truth is right now academic institutions are a major target for cyber criminals as well as state sponsored activity. We know this because we see it every week. The academic sector is being hit hard right now due to COVID. Uh, you know, with ransomware attacks and with phishing campaigns, uh, which enable ransomware attacks. Criminals are leveraging the panic around the pandemic uh, to entice those in the sector to click on malicious links or visit malicious websites and pay ransom uh, when, da when data becomes unavailable. And we also know, again, because we've seen it in many examples, that there's a huge interest by state-sponsored threat actors to uh, access your intellectual property related to either uh, COVID vaccine research or treatment research or even development or manufacturing. Uh, but research in general beyond the pandemic is a big target and makes academia a, a large target. Uh, the threat is certainly real. On July 16th, the Cyber Center made a joint public statement with our US and UK partners stating that Russian uh, threat actors were trying to gain access to vaccine research as well as information about medical supply chains. And on July, in mid-July, uh, the US Department of Justice indicted two Chinese hackers who were targeting vaccine research and development on behalf of uh, Chinese intelligence services. And the reality of this is that the threat is really not unique to us to having a pandemic. The truth is cyber criminals are opportunistic. They're just 
simply are. Uh, just the other day, the FBI released a flash alert that ransomware actors are very likely using significant financial events uh, that take place on a regular basis, such as mergers and acquisitions to target companies for ransomware infections. Uh, the reason th that things are becoming worse at its core is really simple to identify, yet very com complex to address. And it's really because technology has been the key enablers um, of these attacks and we certainly can't pull the plug on technological advances uh, since canadians and canadian organizations are connecting more of what they value most to the internet malicious cyber threat actors are taking advantage of new and existing vulnerabilities including you know an individual's low cyber security awareness to gain access to digital information they're looking for your information financial intellectual property research personal, whatever it is that you think they might want to get, they probably will be looking for it. Now think about this. How many of you work uh, currently from home or study from home? Uh, how many of you send documents from home to work or, or save uh, work from you know one computer to the other? I just had to do that, unfortunately, because I couldn't connect from my work computer uh, to join the seminar. Now think about this. If your home computer can be compromised, then a threat actor not only has access to your personal information, on your home network. They also have access to your work uh, documents or worse, they could potentially pivot from your home computer into your work or school network once you connect that device. Uh, these breaches are now more common as you may hear in media outlets uh, where data from industries being leaked or sold online by cyber threat actors. And one of my pet peeves is definitely seeing laptops or tablets with that have open browsers with 20 tabs that are open and then Gmail and email accounts that are signed into um, that don't get closed. And quite often when I ask, say something to my friends or colleagues who are doing this, uh, the typical answer that I get is, yeah, right. State actors think I'm so important. They're going to come after me or worse. Really, my pictures or emails aren't that interesting. And even if they got out anyway, what does it matter? All that information is out there. And of course, I often roll my eyes because the truth is, sure, perhaps your life isn't very interesting. Uh, or you may not be so rich that you think uh, nobody would be interested in targeting you. But the truth is, of course, cyber criminals don't care uh, about you specifically, but they, they care that you may be the vector into your organization. And unfortunately, technological advances have made many of these attacks so automated that it ultimately doesn't matter whether your life is interesting or not. Uh, no one is immune and anybody can, as you can see from the diagram, we're so integrated when it comes to individuals, businesses and critical infrastructure that pivoting from one to the next is really not uh, a, a very difficult scenario to imagine. In fact, it's happened historically as you're, you're well aware. There are nations or groups and individuals who seek uh, to take advantage of vulnerabilities. It's just the reality of things. And, and they typically can be categorized by their motivations and to a certain degree by their sophistication. Uh, so it's not always going to be a nation state that might come after you. It's, it really could be just a thrill seeker or somebody who is not happy and an insider threat. Uh, these days with the global pandemic, we're most concerned with the top two on this list, uh, nation states and cyber criminals as they may target, as, as I mentioned, COVID uh, related research. And academia tends to be for the most part mainly targeted by these two top uh, cyber threat actors. Before we go on any further, and I know many of you know this, I just want to very quickly define or just go over ransomware infections in, in general so that we can, you know, just set the ground for what I want to talk to you uh, next. So ransomware, of course, is a type of malicious software which encrypts uh, a victim's files, but not necessarily, not everybody's going through that step. Uh, but when they do encrypt them, they make them inaccessible and, uh, you know, a ransom is demanded uh, in order to decrypt your files so that you can recover them. Um, it's mostly in the form of uh, cryptocurrencies. Back in the day, it used to be yes, mail money when it first started in the 80s. Uh, these days, it's mostly Bitcoin, which makes tracing and prosecuting uh, difficult, but not impossible, as we've seen in recent uh, in recent examples. There are many numerous ways for which ransomware can get at, can get into your system, but the the two most common access points are either going to be via your employees or your students, or via unpatched software. So the top is you know somebody sending you a message directly that contains the, the malware itself or in the second uh, you know, in the second example that's below a threat actor scans for vulnerabilities um, on a system and then exploits them and tries to, to get into them so they send you a message with an attachment uh, traditionally it's been done by email but these days it's it's with the Google Docs or any any type of document that's sent to uh, you know even a company's uh, contact form uh, key to all of these campaigns is using 
uh, tempting bait. The threat actor wants you to interact with the attachment or the link. So they pick something that they think will tempt you. Uh, you know, if you get an email that says annual bonus calculation, or, uh, you know, if you're in public service, you know, you're, you're late pay or something like that, you're, you're likely going to click. Um, the other method, as I mentioned, is uh, via vulnerable services or software, and this we've seen a lot with MSP attacks. Services and software occasionally, of course, not occasionally, always, have unexpected security holes in them, and as a result of their complexity, uh, you know, researchers are always looking for, for uh, you know, things that uh, that need to be patched. And when a new vulnerability is discovered, of course, software companies are quite quick to fix it, but uh, as you'll see you know, in, in a few minutes, uh, uh, people using software aren't quite so fast uh, to download the patch and technology has really uh, made that even more difficult for security and IT um, uh, IT service providers to 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 remain on top of uh, in to on top of these vulnerabilities, regardless of how you get infected. At this point, what happens next is typically threat actors look to spread as widely as they can through your network. Um, this is used for two main purposes. The first is that it lets them discover what kind of information that you have, uh, for or what you may consider to be valuable, which helps them with with data theft. And we'll talk about that in a second. It also means they're able to get access, of course, to more of your system, which means uh, when they do deliver the ransomware and lock things down, it will affect a lot more than what initially uh, could have been, uh, you know, potentially a, a localized um, uh, attack. Next, credentials and data are stolen. Uh, typically, uh, and files are encrypted, and then data theft is becoming increasingly popular, um, increasingly and exponentially. In 2020, just over 50% of ransomware incidents involved data theft. In 2021, and we're not even at the end of the year yet, it's over 80%. Uh, this threat is especially high in sectors with sensitive intellectual property such as yours, or those who store large amounts of personal data, um, again, such as yours. Uh, data is stolen from you, and you know, and it's really important uh, to, to know how threat actors got into your system, uh, because that data ends up uh, often uh, ends up getting sold on the dark web as a secondary revenue source. And at this point, your files have been encrypted, and you need to make a decision as to whether you want to pay a ransom or not. Um, our recommendations been don't pay ransom. Uh, however, that's not a simple decision. And whether you pay or not, it's vitally important, of course, for you to review your network and make sure you're, uh, you know, check your data integrity, determine how people, how the threat actors got in in the first place. Uh, one sobering example of uh, whether uh, paying a ransom uh, or, or but not doing this cleanup is, uh, you know, uh, a UK, um, the, the UK NCSC tells of a company that was hit by ransomware, paid up millions of dollars in ransom, but didn't investigate what happened and was then hit by the same group two weeks later and was forced to pay again. So, uh, yeah, no honor among thieves. Um, and before I move on to the next uh, step, I just want to take a, a moment to, to talk about something that we don't always refer to or talk about in cybersecurity, and that's the human aspect of things. Uh, being at ransomware is a tremendously stressful event, uh, with some people reporting it feeling similar to, to experiencing a home invasion in terms of loss of privacy and safety. Um, if you're a large business that's hit by ransomware, you may be thinking about uh, whether your suppliers and your customers are going to trust you afterwards, and that's a very valid uh, question. Or if you work there, whether you're going to have a job after this. If you're a small or medium-sized business, you may be thinking you spent the last 10 years building your company and you don't know if you're going to have to close down. And cyber criminals really prey on that, which is why extortion tactics are so successful. And uh, on this slide, you'll see, you know, there are so many of them and they've gotten really uh, creative. So. Uh, deletion of backups. Uh, we see ransomware operators uh, before they encrypt your files, go through your network, identify possible break, uh, you know, backups, either corrupt them or delete them in advance of encrypting your systems. Uh, double extortion or data leaks. So ransomware operators, they steal your information, but you don't know that because all you're seeing is a locked screen. They steal your intellectual property and databases of sensitive employee and client data uh, and then threaten to publicize it. Sorry, one second. To coerce payment. And this happens a lot on the dark web, which I'll talk to, we'll talk about in a second. And then we're also seeing tactics through the form of customer contact. Uh, you you may get actually contacted by the threat actors directly and threatened to, to have your stolen information. Uh, either used for identity theft or simply uh, demanding, uh, you know, 
that you pay in order to protect uh, your privacy. And uh, there's a third, I don't know if you can call it a triple uh, extortion, they can lock you down and they can steal your data. And on top of that, they may hit you with a DDoS. And this, uh, the reason I mention this is really just because this is all the role of um, the, the reality of the evolution of technology and how simple these attacks have become in terms of their automated in terms of their automation. So ultimately, when you're hit by ransomware, you can very safely assume that some of your data has been stolen, uh, not just locked up, not just uh, not just uh, encrypted. And what I want to talk to you about next is what happens to it. <coughs> and one of the key enablers of the epidemic of ransomware is the dark web. Um, I'm not sure how many of you, or if any of you, got locked out of your CRA accounts last year all of a sudden. I happen to be one of the very fortunate people that got locked out not once but twice and both times it was because the CRA had actually enlisted uh, the <laughs> services of a cybersecurity company and they did a scan of the dark web and there happened to be a very 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 old email address of mine that was floating around and that's that's the unfortunate reality is that all of our organizations likely have some employee or student credentials that have been stolen leaked sold and resold multiple times Thankfully, in my case, the most I suffered was having to spend a couple of hours on hold uh, with the CRA, which is quite painful, but for some other people, they weren't as lucky. Uh, this information is actually dated, but researchers even back in 2017 found millions of university-linked accounts on sale, um, for sale on the dark web. They found 14 million emails and passwords associated with the 300 universities, uh, largest universities in the U.S. available for sale. Um, at the time, it was the University of Michigan that had number one, uh, but it was uh, when adjusted for enrollment, it was actually MIT that took uh, that place. And, and there are many theories as to why MIT might be the most targeted, uh, the most obvious of which is a its student body accessing perhaps the dark web uh, or, you know, just, you know, you accessing technology more than potentially other uh, universities, but also the wealth of intellectual property uh, that it has. At the end of the day, the, the reason doesn't really matter. The question is, is this exposed data dangerous and can it be used to mount an attack against you as an institution? Um, the university in Scotland would tell you yes. Uh, the University of the Highlands and Islands was targeted by ransomware and it was posited. We can never know for sure unless you're actually part of the investigation that it was perhaps due to leaked credentials that were found on the dark web. Uh, the university was spread across 13 campuses that had to shut down essentially as they dealt with an incident that impacted key systems and services. And it was revealed that the data had been previously posted on the dark web and may have been used by hackers to mount the attack. And according to the analysis that was posted, there were over 8,000 leaked credentials, including email addresses and passwords belonging to staff and to students. So it's not just uh, one segment of the population of the university. So uh, they may not necessarily have been connected to the ransomware attack, however, the researcher said, this just shows uh, what opportunities cyber criminals have when they target these institutions and what they can get to. But uh, in terms of your institutions, what else is out there on the dark web when it comes to academia beyond like leak credentials? The market for fake diplomas is certainly a booming one. It's not new. Multiple vendors are selling degrees and accreditations out there that seem legitimate. Uh, many boast about the quality, but that's not the more important bit. Um, one person, uh, slightly reminiscent of a movie, <coughs> sorry, I apologize. There's a flourishing market for hackers, and, and I make this point for a second because I'll, I'll mention the specialization in ransomware um, in a minute. There's a student who uh, is very enterprising and uh, posted saying that they were looking for an experienced hacker in Apache or LDAP server who understands systems invasion in order to change a few notes in my system, in my university system, uh, while another student wanted to find out how much it would cost to get the login passwords for a university admin. But what we're seeing really is more and more, and what I'm trying to get to here um, is the prof prof professionalization of dark web uh, forums. So when we think of the dark web, uh, we think of marketplaces and we think of forums. Uh, they have really slick looking websites. They're, they're not that you know, different than what you would see on in the clear net. Uh, they provide very decent customer service and cybercrime has generated many innovations if we think about it from escrow service providers to Bitcoin tumblers and mixers. The images on this slide happen to be from 
uh, Magbo, which is one of many marketplaces that are out there. And it's true, many get taken down, but many simply pop up in their place and replace them. And, and they, they, they tend to all look the same. You see how it provides multiple interactive features, a nice looking interface. It even allows users to rate buyers and I believe vice versa. Buyers can actually rate uh, the, you know, the sellers. <coughs> it actively responds to complaints. So you see in the image uh, below that the seller has been banned. Uh, Magbo also allows its transactions to be reviewed on an independent site called Onion.Live, which is an online service for uh, users to report on transactions and track scammers. Uh, so just for reference, it's just not for hacking services to change my grades or DDoS in my university or fake diplomas that students can purchase. Um, for those of you who do not read Farsi, the bottom right uh, corner is somebody who is selling access to academic journals and libraries. Now, common wisdom and advice would tell you that if you go to the dark web to purchase something, you're likely going to get scammed. Now, that might be true if you're trying to hire a hitman. You're more likely to end up communicating with, with a law enforcement officer than with an actual hitman. But uh, the fact that purchasing things on, on dark web marketplaces and communicating with cyber criminals on forums is a dangerous en endeavor is to some extent true. And we've seen definitely marketplaces fold and take off with their users' money. Uh, those that host, those of them that hosted wallets, we've even seen the same happen with exchanges that have also disappeared all, all overnight. But believe it or not, those tend to be the anomalies. Uh, most of you know by now the story of Silk Road, and it was really the sale of illicit drug that popularized marketplaces um, and, the, and the dark web. It's like the Silk Road. Now, if you're a drug dealer and you actually want to be successful, you don't just sell a crappy product uh, to a handful of customers and then just take off, or worse, just take their money and run. The key to your survival and your profitability is repeat business, which is why we see, uh, you know, things such as uh, ratings and and uh, the transparency and trying to to have some kind of protections for both sellers and buyers, uh, and that essentially means you need to build trust uh, with your client base, which is why features. Uh, like the ones that I just mentioned, uh, exist. So, in a very professionalized cybercrime ecosystem, Bitcoin might be the Bitcoin might be the currency, but trust is actually the most important commodity. Which is why takedown after takedown, we still continue to see marketplaces continue to pop up. And interestingly enough, in order to maintain a long-term trust relationship, sellers even try to their best to maintain their same usernames or a version of it, so you can actually follow them across marketplaces if your clients and also helps uh, admins to, to verify them. Uh, but what is also interesting and what is also important in terms of prof professionalizing cybercrime is the appearance of the as-a-service model. Um, as-a-service model, um, trust is king. So being the baddest at what you do uh, means that you're the best. And there are many things that have been using this modular as-a-service model. We've seen phishing as a service, DDoS as a service. There are many things that have been using this modular as a service model, including ransomware, and that's been the most effective and most devastating one of all. Uh, the model is very efficient, especially dangerous when applied to malware, uh, because it is essentially very accessible and it's very, uh, you know, very affordable to many people. Uh, on the one hand, uh, you know, ransomware operators can ask for subscription fees or use an affiliate model where they just develop their own ransomware and then they distribute through a distributor. They, they're very easy to use. They don't require coding efforts. You can manage your campaigns from online portals and, and the cost really is not that high. You can see here it can range anywhere from 50 to a couple of thousand dollars. The biggest danger of ransomware as a service is that it can potentially anyone allow anyone to carry out a malware campaign and become a cyber extortionist. Uh, the diffusion of ransomware as a service contributed to a, in a significant way to the growth that we've seen in ransomware attacks. And a growing number of ransomware gangs are extending their networks of affiliates. So the affiliates are the distributors that will that has been causing a spike and will continue to cause a spike of infections in the future. Uh, one of the most uh, active ransomware gangs, uh, the Arivol uh, ransomware or Sodium to Kibi, uh, they've disappeared uh, just uh, not recently. They they deposited one million dollars in Bitcoin, actually trying to recruit and involve distributors. So it's not just uh, ransomware. You can actually, of course, uh, pretty much buy anything, botnets. Uh, and, and this problem is really very, 
very uh, severe, and I cannot highlight why. Uh, in essence, it makes elite tools that have been developed by highly sophisticated criminals and even, you know, advanced persistent threat actors for special targets such as nation states or multi-million or organizations, it puts those very same tools in the hands of your average cyber criminal. Uh, so it's not unfathomable that someone who does not have any coding IT skills could be able to, for the right price, uh, with things such as MSPs, uh, just, you know, hire an elite cybercrime tool uh, or even just have them do the attack for them and uh, and go after a college or university. It's mo this, this model that researchers, for the most part, believe uh, we uh, is, is responsible for the huge surge in ransomware attacks that we're seeing today. These tools are very highly sophisticated and they're also ever evolving. They're using technologies such as machine learning and uh, they're getting better at improving at uh, evading detect detection systems. So when the cyber criminal and you are using the same uh, tools at your disposal, uh, the fight really becomes that, that, that much more uh, difficult. Uh, this is just an example of the fact that even when they take down, right now we're seeing more decentralized uh, dark web forums that, that do ransomware. They're multi-channel, omni-channel, so you can reach them on Wicker email. If you've got ideas, feel free to hit them on, on Telegram. And now what I want to talk about is, is essentially uh, the issues. So what are these enablers? Leveraging technology and tools uh, as well as uh, ransomware lineages. And, you know, of course, we cannot talk about ransomware whether, without considering whether we should pay or not pay ransoms. Um, the, the main reason is, uh, you know, as, as I mentioned, ransomware as an issue is becoming exceedingly challenging. Uh, it's exceedingly challenging to forecast. We often, we, we had to adjust uh, and made, make a more, you know, uh, you know, severe forecast uh, several months after having made an initial one just because of how things have, have changed because of these trends. And some more is a problem of technology, a problem of politics and criminality. Um, and there's a very, there's a lot that I can cover, but uh, we, can, we can only, uh, you know, uh, pick and choose so many things. So one of the many issues when it comes to ransomware is what I mentioned, uh, it's modularity. Uh, this is problematic for many different reasons. Uh, for example, the cost to develop malware is dropping because of advances in machine language uh, and machine learning, uh, the affordability of com cloud computing resources, as well as several pieces that constitute your ransomware encry encryption. So you've got your dropper, your, your sorry, your, your, you know, your loader, your dropper, and then the actual locker. Uh, and you as a cybersecurity, uh, you know, uh, uh, specialist have to fight on all three fronts. Uh, it's becoming, they're becoming increasingly better at evading detection systems because of automation and, and small changes that they're doing. Uh, when cyber criminals, like I said, are using the same tools that we are, it makes it, makes it really very challenging to, to sort of, uh, challenge uh, to, to defend this. Um, when when we talk about the the not one malware issue, this is what I was talking about in terms of the infection being multi-pronged. You've got the dropper, you've got the distributor, you've got the locker itself. And then I just mentioned the, the machine learning AI effect, which can be used both defensively by you or offensively by them. Uh, the affiliate model is the distributor model. In a recent interview, uh, just to, to show you how prevalent this model is, uh, this was uh, actually a year ago uh, on a Russian language YouTube Telegram channel that's focused on hacking. Uh, one of the operators of Revol, or Revol, one of the questions was asked, uh, you know, the the journalist asked him, "Is it true that you actually split the the revenue 70, 80 goes to the to the distributor, whereas 20, 30 goes to the developer?" And the answer was, "Yes, that's correct. Those who spread the malware do the most work, and that is in fact true. Uh, with regard to changes in ransomware variants, it's really easy uh, to do that." Uh, the one last point on this slide, which is the role of pen testing tools, is one that I don't like to mention a lot, but the fact uh, of the matter is uh, the, the high quality pen testing tools that are out there, uh, you know, they're, they're used by criminals as well as by uh, cyber defenders. So um, something something to keep in mind, of course, the biggest example is Cobalt Strike, Metasploit, uh, but recently, you know, um, of course, Cobalt Strike remains the most widely used, uh, most notably by Darkseid and by Revel, by others. But uh, in the Colonial Pipeline attack, uh, there was uh, the use of F-Secure C3 tools. So this dual use of pen testing tools is really problematic. 
uh, ransomware lineages is simply referring to how easy it is for a ransomware group to simply just shut down, rebrand, and come up with a with a new uh, malware variant. Um, so the most recent one is an example. It's called uh, Macau. I think it just there was a report on it just a couple of days ago, and it belongs to, uh, you know, it has significant overlaps with ransomware families in the wasted locker lineage, including the Hades, Hades Freedance Locker and the Hades uh, Payload Bin. Of course, anti-analysis techniques make, make it difficult to conduct a, a direct code comparison, but there's significant overlaps that suggest that it just may be a rebranded version of the Hades ransomware. Uh, so what we do see is that, you know, the actors that are responsible for Wasted Locker and Hades have previously rebranded their ransomware attempts to evade sanctions. Uh, in 2019, uh, when uh, the U.S. Department of Treasury uh, sanctioned Evil Corps for their role in Drydex, uh, you know, public reporting suggested that Wasted Locker and Hades were associated with the, car with the current or former Evil Corps actors. So they just, you know, popped up and started spreading different ransomware. And that's where we talk about lineages. Uh, at some point, uh, will this remain to be the case? We don't know uh, because, uh, you know, there, there are sanctions and there are costs to them. But, uh, you know, researchers are still on the fence as to whether they're very effective or not. But for the time being, we still see a lot of, uh, you know, the punitive costs uh, for these uh, for these. Uh, breaches is not preventing these lineages from continuing uh, from one uh, from one uh, ransomware variant to the next. Uh, the punitive costs due to can you know due to, to data breaches certainly outweigh ransom demands and interestingly in the SOFOS uh, uh, survey that I mentioned only five percent uh, you know, uh, said that the data was not encrypted, yet organizations was still held, held to ransom just by the threat of encryption. Uh, and there there has been an increase in extortion style attacks over the years. But instead of uh, encrypting your files, they simply threatened to publish them instead. Uh, and this requires, of course, less effort uh, on the part of the attacker. So we don't even need lineages. We just need to threaten you with encryption. Um, over the last year, uh, internally, we did a bit of research and uh, security research firms following leak sites have reported about 62 instances of data leak from education uh, service institutions. Um, next up, I just want to cover that between the dark net, um, irregular reporting, and just the general chaos that is the dark web and the field of cybersecurity at times, one of the few ways that we can try and detect changes in ransomware activity is through monitoring leak sites or victim blogs, which are used in double extortion campaigns. Uh, but I want to say up front that with Whatever we read from this is very difficult to generalize, but you'll see changes can have multiple explanations and no single hypothesis is certainly better than others. So while at the end of the day, it's it's a flawed metric, it's still one that is interesting to see. And it's difficult to keep track given the frequent takedowns, but if you tried, you can reasonably track anywhere between 20 to 30 leak sites or victim blogs at a time. And a redundancy analysis would show that, you know, every day there's five or six new victims that are named or shamed, depending on how you want to put it. So far through, close to 3,000 organizations have been listed. Close to 7% were subsequently removed, but does that mean they were removed because they paid out the ransom? Not necessarily. Uh, what's more interesting is that there's actually been outliers, and the outliers have been the largest attacks that we've seen out there. So the Colonial Pipeline attack was discussed by Darkside in a special press release announcement by, by the operators, where they said that they were apolitical and did not want to cause problems for society. Um, it's a landmark case for many reasons because the U.S. was able to, of course, retrieve some of the, uh, recover some of the, the, the paid ransom. And in the situation, the ransom was paid. The data was not actually, you know, put published anywhere. In fact, it was just a press release that I just mentioned. Um, uh, dark side victim blog, uh, in a way, it was taken down. And then, however, Black Matter ransomware operator seems to be a rebrand of this. But they also seem to be taken down this week. The second interesting example is the Irish Health uh, Service Executive, which was hit by Conti. Again, it was not a typical double extortion victim. Uh, here, they actually, they named and shamed 400 organizations. Conti had been doing that for many, many, uh, you know, since uh, since they, they came into existence. But 
given all the media attention and the refusal of the Irish government to pay, uh, finally the, the criminals acquiesced and actually offered HSC the decryptor tool for free. Uh, and the government refused to pay even though the cost was uh, to recovery was about 600 million, estimated to be 600 million, but they stood fast. So uh, the, you know, the, the pressure, mounting pressure on cyber criminals isn't always uh, you know, a strategy that is uh, that doesn't work. And of course, everybody knows the Ari Volkasea VSA hit what happened in, in mid July where they went after MSPs. Uh, two weeks later, uh, they you know again they did not publish uh, the, the 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 list. They just mentioned that they actually conducted the attack and were were there. Um, less than two weeks later, the R the um, Evil Happy blog, which is uh, now you can see in the image uh, visible there, um, it disappeared, leading to speculation as to whether it was actually taken down by uh, law enforcement or whether uh, you know. Kaseya had paid up. Again, there's, uh, there's, you know, a, a decryptor appeared at the same time, so our people start can can read into it whatever it is that they may may want to read into it. But it shows that not there is no uniform model of attack when it comes to ransomware, and there really is uh, no way of of really knowing what the outcome is going to be. Uh, it's really it's really dependent on a case by case basis. But there are some future trends that we can see, and unfortunately, like you, I mentioned, excuse me, Russia, can yeah. you, you take just one one or two more minutes? Yeah, least? we're done. This is this is the last okay. slide. This is the last slide. Absolutely. So the future trends are just things are gonna get worse. They're accelerating. Uh, Criminals are getting better at exploiting vulnerabilities faster, RDPs, VPNs, MSPs. Variants are appearing more quickly. Uh, we're seeing increased specialization in cybercrime ecosystems. So uh, the last thing that, of course, I want to leave you with is that your best, the only best thing to do and the only thing to do is, of course, invest in preparation, offline backup solutions, and, you know, business continuity planning and don't just rely on you know the fine backup business processes ahead of time and the cyber center's got a whole bunch of resources that are that are useful for for at least you know planning these things and thinking about uh, you know ransomware in general and and how you plan to to deal with it and i will wrap up with that sorry for for taking and digging into the q a time <laughs> thank you so much russia for this interesting talk it was really a nice presentation thank you i appreciate it thank you and so it's time for some quick questions guys so please go ahead if you have any question any questions they're, they're too afraid of, of being hit by ransomware now <laughs> i think i scared them uh, thank you very much uh, and uh, um, i know that i took into the q a time but if anybody has any questions please feel free to, to forward them my way and i'm really more than happy to to answer them uh via email at any point okay so i yeah one more ahead. question uh, uh, thank you uh, to russia for for <laughs> helping us get really scared about this and the, <laughs> It, it's, it's very important for us to, to keep this in mind, it, not just as an institution, but also as individuals. Uh, there's a lot of information that we put out there in, in the internet, in social media, our phones, uh, what we do on, on, online with our computers. So it's, it's always good to have this in mind and keep this in mind because we need to be protected. And thank you. Thank you for raising this and <laughs> making it uh, a point to, to scare us uh, in a good way. Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ramdes. Yes, Alison, please go ahead. Thank you, Asha. What a wonderful presentation. Um, I'll follow up with uh, Ramsey's point, you know, that yes, you scared us, but you also gave us some amazing data, you know, and you started out by saying seven out of 10 Canadians have said please and thank you to their voice activated assistant. That's really, you know, yeah. great to hear. So thank you for sharing such uh, inform interesting information. And as the students are listening um, and, and to your presentation, this is very valuable for not only coursework, but for our own personal lives. And the dean, as the Dean of Faculty of Management, I just want to say thank you for sharing your knowledge and information with us today. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much for, for having me. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Yes, Zell, please go ahead. Um, it's more of a comment than a question. Um, I was just thinking really about the 
exposure value um, Russia has presented us with. And I think that that's missing in most cases, the feeling people usually have of, oh, they wouldn't bother gets to us, we're, we're too small or minute to be bothered with. And I know Russia has um, the um, um, sector with the high institutions regularly, because I, I, I'm part of that too, but I'm just wondering how best we could make this exposure even more so um, valuable to, to the colleges and institutions, because that's a major problem I've noticed where they think they won't bother with us, no one gets to us, and it's it's becoming more about negligence than even making sure that one is a titan. Yes, I think talks like this one and, and just more education and, and more awareness, certainly, as to why they, they might be a target or why even speaking to your voice assistant to say thank you. That's information that, that's getting recorded, that's, that's going up there. We don't tend to think about it and it becomes invisible. So it's really, I think, uh, you know, incumbent upon us, uh, you know, both in the cybersecurity realm as well as in the academia realm to just continuously raise awareness and and say yes these these the things are amazing these devices are great and you may think you're not important but guess what you're you're just one po entry point into the university into your college into your and and that's where the we're in the problem and i think case studies in this situation really help paint a great picture and there have been quite a few uh, out there where where you you've seen the transmission from one individual who really didn't intend to in fact uh to to an institution so uh you know including that kind of uh, that that kind of uh, uh example would always help you know make it more real for for students and scaring them isn't always the best way uh giving them examples I, I tend to see or think works better because there's there's no way it's not optional for us these days to just opt out of uh, you know engaging with any of these connected uh, connected uh, digital digital tools and and uh, appliances that we have in our daily lives. Thank you so much, Russia. Thank you very much. Um, that's Thank you. Yeah. So we have a last question from Dr. Sergey. Will the slides be shared? The, this session is recorded, so we can share the recording. Can yes, you share the slides or I, I will I will send you an email with the uh, caveats regarding our TLP Amber. So I will I, I will do that with you uh, after after this call. After, after Abdullah. Appreciate it. Okay, great. Yes, Alison, please go ahead. It's the Thank last you. thing. <laughs> Thank you, Aslam. I did want to just point out for faculty and staff uh, accounts at the at Concordia University of Edmonton, we are going through a process so that we're gonna have multi-factor authentication for staff and faculty accounts. And I know that some people are, you know, concerned about change, but, uh, you know, th this is another um, point. Oh, in, yeah, sorry, that, uh, that we're just initiating in, which was recently announced. Absolutely. One of the best things that you can do is uh, multi-factor authentication. Certainly, certainly. Happy to hear that more and more uh, universities <laughs> are taking this on. So it's, it's not, change is not easy. That's That's the main thing. And not a lot of people appreciate why you're making things a bit more complex for them as opposed to simpler. Uh, but certainly really appreciate uh, learning that. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Rasha, again for your interesting talk. And thanks, thanks everyone for attending the seminar. Thank you. Really we will see you in our next seminar on December 9, 2021. See you all. Bye. Yeah. Have a good day. Bye-bye.